Ok, now we're live. Bueno, eh, bienvenidos a todos al seminario del Departamento de Ciencias Biológicas. Este seminario está en cargo por los eh, estudiantes de posgrado. Yo en este momento soy representante en la sección de maestría y hoy tuvimos la suerte de estar con eh, Dr. Robert Reed. Eh, les voy a contar un poquito cómo fue el proceso de selección. Entre todos los estudiantes eh, votamos y, bueno, entre todos los estudiantes primero seleccionamos a algunos investigadores y luego votamos y nuestro ganador fue el Dr. Robert Reed de la Universidad de Cornell. Entonces les voy a contar un poquito sobre quién es Dr. Reed y en qué trabaja. Eh, él es profesor y curador de la epidóptera de la Universidad de Cornell y tiene un interés principal en la evolución y desarrollo de patrones de coloración, especialmente en las alas de mariposa. Su grupo de investigación se centra mucho en, en, en investigar por qué suceden estos patrones en la naturaleza y cómo se diversifican, especialmente en la parte genética. Dr. Reed hizo su pregrado en la Universidad de Berkeley y su doctorado en la Universidad de Arizona, y bueno, ya sin más preámbulos, le voy a dar la palabra a Dr. Reed. Muchas gracias a todos por conectarse y por estar aquí hoy. Y no se les olvide, por favor, hacer las preguntas en el chat al final de la charla. So, now, I'm gonna, you can go. Right. Well, thank you. Thanks for uh, tuning in and listening. Um, I'm so excited to, to be here. I, I wish I was in Bogota in person. Columbia is one of the most amazing, beautiful places on earth, and I really wish I could be there right now. So you know, hopefully when, when things get better, I can, uh, I can come visit. Um, I also want to say, say thanks to the students for inviting me. Of course, that's one of the greatest honors uh, you can ever have as, as an academic, um, to be invited by, by students to give a presentation. So I, I hope you in, enjoy um, what I'll be describing to you about our research on butterfly wing patterns. And uh, like Carolina said, I'll be happy to take um, Take any questions afterward, or you know, even after the seminar, if you have questions about our research or any methods that we're using, uh, feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, okay. All right, I'll be talking about uh, butterfly wing patterns for the next hour or so. That's pretty much all that we work on in my lab. Um, but of course, work on wing patterns didn't start uh, in our lab. People have been interested in wing patterns for a long time. Uh, formal research you know, goes back to the, to the 19th century. But work on wing pattern kind of genetics and Evo Devo, I think, can really trace to a guy named Boris Schwanwich. He was a Russian entomologist. Uh, and th this is his tombstone in St. Petersburg, Russia. And you could see on this obelisk an image of two butterfly wings. Uh, there's a forewing and a hindwing right there. But these images don't represent any actual living butterflies. What they are is uh, what we call now the, the ground plan, the nymphalid ground plan, uh, which is a, a system of pattern elements that we could use to draw uh, evolutionary homologies between all the different butterflies and most likely the moths too, to understand um, how color patterns uh, morph between within and between different species to give us all the diversity we see today. So this was Schwanwich's original uh, ground plan from the 1920s. And we won't go into detail about specific elements, but you could see all the different spots and stripes all over the wing, right? And the, the idea is that uh, by changing the position, the size, and the color of elements, you can produce all of the different color patterns that you see in nature. Right, so, uh, so you can see some of these butterflies have really prominent eye spots. You know, some of the eye spots have gotten really big and some of them, the eye spots have disappeared. They've changed size and color. These different stripes have moved up and down the wings, become more or less prominent. And uh, you know, there's a whole literature in the early 20th century coming, coming from Schwanwich and Seufert and others uh, that proposed all of these uh, evolutionary homologies between the different color pattern elements. Although you know, they really had no, understanding of the genetics or development of, of how any of this worked. Um, but today, this gives us a really nice system to ask questions about where new traits come from biologically, 
and how they change, right? We know a lot about butterfly phylogeny, the evolutionary history of butterflies. And uh, you know, these are traits that are very easy to look at and score and to think about. And as I'll show you over the next um, hour, we can, we can do genetics and development on these things to understand um, and ask very explicit questions about how they originated and how they change. So over the last um, you know, 15 or 20 years, we've made a ton of progress linking genes to this ground plan. And you know, I, I won't have time to talk about much of this, unfortunately, uh, but we know a lot about how eye spots develop, the different stripes. Uh, we know about uh, uh, morphogens or uh, you know, these, uh, these molecules that induce patterns to form across the wings. We know a lot about the pigment genes and how pigments switch. Um, and you know, we can actually go back and tie specific genes to many different um, elements of this ground plan that Schwanwich proposed. And what is really remarkable is, is how accurate this ground plan was in, in terms of thinking about the independence of individual color patterns, uh, the genetic developmental independence. One of the things that we've um, we've really seen over and over again with a, a lot of genetic work is that these wing patterns are highly modular, just like Schwanwich proposed. Um, so here's one really beautiful example with eye spots. Here's a buckeye butterfly. Uh, this is wild type form. So if you went out and collected a butterfly, you know, pretty much uh, one of these butterflies pretty much anywhere in North America, it would, it would look like this. Um, and then we can knock out a single gene the, the, in this case, we're knocking out a transcription factor called SPALT using CRISPR, and we could just lose all the eye spots, right? So we have a single gene that activates eye spots. And the remarkable thing is you'll see that all of the other color patterns here are basically unchanged. They're conserved. So it's, you know, just by erasing this one gene, it's like taking a little eraser and just getting rid of eye spots. So these patterns are highly modular. Um, here's another really nice example of this modularity. This is a, a gene that um, we've worked a lot on and a lot of other labs have worked on it uh, too more recently. Uh, when A, so this is a, a signaling gene, uh, it's a signaling ligand. Here is a butterfly wing from a caterpillar actually. In, in, in dark purple, you can see where this gene when A is expressed. So there's a stripe along the margin here and a stripe down the middle of the wing. Here's what this particular butterfly looks like. It's a painted lady butterfly. And if you knock it out, knock out this gene, the whole stripe system in the middle goes away. I saw that, I thought, oh my God, that's so cool. So cool, right? So again, th there's this uh, idea of modularity where you, you can ha actually have single genes activating very discrete independent color pattern elements. So I'll also look at the margin here too. You can see the margin changes as well as, as the center stripe. Um, so Angie Mazo Vargas, she's a Colombian student um, in my lab. Uh, she's done a ton of amazing work on WinA, and I, I'm not going to talk about it anymore today. Uh, but Angie will be giving an online presentation, a seminar at University of Florida on February 23rd. So if you want to learn more about her um, incredible work on the regulatory genetics of WinA. Um, across species, um, please check that out. Okay, so I'm limited in time, and there's so many cool genes, so many cool patterns to talk about, um, but I, I can only choose two. So I think today I'm going to tell two stories. Um, the first one about a gene called optics, and I like to think of this as a, a sort of color paintbrush gene, and, and you'll see why in a moment. And then I'm going to end with uh, uh, a discussion of our newest work on the the genetic basis of seasonality or, or how those color patterns actually change between between seasons over very short time scales. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the paintbrush gene. And we first found this gene by working on Heliconius butterflies, which you know hopefully most or all of you are familiar with. Um, there's a lot of really famous work that's been done in, in Colombia on these butterflies. And Colombia is really the center of diversity uh, for these, and a lot of that work actually come from, comes from um, Universidad de los Andes, um, work from Mauricio Lenares and, and, and the, his colleagues. Um, so these butterflies are super interesting uh, for several reasons. Um, first of all, they participate in mimicry rings. So there's been a lot of convergent evolution in these butterflies. 
where you could have one species, this is for instance, Heliconia serrato, that looks identical to a completely unrelated species. In this case, it's Heliconia smelpomini, right? So you have this convergent evolution. These things are separated by maybe 12 million years. The genomes are completely different sizes, right? We know this is definitely convergent evolution that's happened between these, uh, right? There's no hybridization or anything. And uh, we're fairly certain that Melpomene evolved to look like Erato. The other thing that makes this, in, so all these butterflies are poisonous, right? Uh, so this is what we call Mullerian mimicry. There's selection on all these things to look identical to teach birds that they're toxic. The other thing that's super interesting about these is this variation within species, right? So this is one species right here, Heliconius Erato. And all throughout Central and South America, there's these really, really dramatically different color pattern forms that you could find, especially in uh, all along the foothills of the Andes. Um, and this variation has really gone wild, right? So, uh, you know, there's over 20 named forms of, of, of both of these species in particular. Um, and, you know, wherever these two species co-occur, they tend to look like each other, right? Again, it's this uh, convergent evolution, this selection for mimicry that's caused this. Um, and it's not just these two species, but, you know, this is a genus of, you know, 50 or so species, and most of them have multiple forms that uh, are engaged in mimicry. And the natural selection on these things is so, on Lepidopter, not just these butterflies, not just Heliconius, so strong um, that you'll find a lot of other butterflies and even day flying moths that have evolved, uh, to match these, um, warning color patterns, right? So here's a, uh, paracopine moth I collected in the Peruvian Amazon. It looks just like a Heliconius. It even, uh, flaps its wings at the same rate. Uh, just incredible, right? And there's a lot of moths that look like these things. So, so we, I'm just, uh, reemphasizing the point that the selection on these things is really strong. A fun fact about this thing is that, uh, you know, when you collect the, these, uh, these paracopines, they actually spray out presumably this toxic foam from the back of their heads, you know, uh, so cool. All right. So a nice thing about having all the variation within species is that you can do genetic crosses to understand, uh, the, the genetic basis of, of the color pattern variation and mimicry. And this is making a really long story that involves many different labs and investigators, really short. Uh, but basically, there's three, three or four major genes that control uh, all the color pattern variation. Uh, the names are important uh, here. These are the these are the the early names before we actually identified the uh, the molecular genes. But the point here is that there's a gene that controls all the red color pattern variation. There's a gene that controls this uh, yellow stripe on the hind wing and the margin, uh, the white on the margin of the wing. And then there's uh, a gene that controls the black smudges basically on the wing. So here you can see that, uh, you know, there's this black uh, stripe here and uh, in different locations, you have the stripe kind of moving up and down the wing and changing shape. So three major genes. Uh, these turned out to be optics, cortex, and wint A. And uh, this is kind of an old story now, but it was very surprising, you know, 10 or 15 years ago when we first discovered it, but these three genes seem to control uh, the vast majority of color pattern adaptation and mimicry across all Heliconia species. So all these different labs that mapped these genes and all these really different looking Heliconius butterflies, they always mapped the same low side, right? So we have a couple genes of major effect and all these genes have very different alleles that make uh, these you know, spectacular color patterns that are all really different. Uh, so we were part of a large collaboration uh, that, uh, that was able to identify uh, the red color pattern gene and the black color pattern gene. And I'll be talking about the red color pattern gene now. Um, and I won't go into the details of, of how we found it. You do it much different these days than we did uh, back in the day. Uh, you know, we were using uh, genetic mapping and targeted genome sequencing and microarrays and all this stuff that's uh, uh, you know pretty passe, not really worth doing anymore. But basically, um, 
uh, with Ricardo Papa and Owen McMillan's group, uh, you know, we got to this region of the genome here. There's a bunch of genes. You know, one of these had to be the color pattern gene. And th this is a microarray study, so it's kind of equivalent to uh, like RNA-seq, what we would do now, looking at differential expression across this region of the genome that we mapped to. Uh, so we did a big experiment and you know, we basically looked at gene expression and all these different color pattern elements in these different butterflies. Uh, Ricardo is a postdoc in my lab who, who spearheaded a lot of this work at the time. He has his own lab at University of Puerto Rico right now. Um, and we found there's strong differential expression in these different color pattern elements in the mapping interval right here at this one gene called optics, right? Again, so, so we crossed butterflies, we mapped this region, and one gene was differentially expressed in red versus non-red. And when we looked at expression in the wings, bam, it looked just like the red color pattern elements. So this is the red color pattern gene, right? It's transcription factor optics. It's called optics because um, it's involved with eye development and fruit flies. If you knock it out, they lose their eyes. And it's, it's one of these kind of jack of all trade transcription factors. It probably does lots of different things uh, throughout development. But it's really interesting in butterflies, it's taken on this one new role in making color patterns. Um, right, so here's a comparison of uh, a rado melpomene, right? And you can see it's expressed exactly in, in the red color patterns. Um, here's just another example of uh, some am Amazonian forms of melpomene and a rado, and, and this is uh, the messenger RNA expression in, in the wing discs. You can see it looks exactly like, like the the color patterns, so beautiful heliconius at this. So basically any heliconius we look at, we see a positive correlation between optics expression and red color patterns, just like we would expect. And um, th that work was done some time ago, you know, but we never actually like functionally showed exactly what optics can do, but we can do that with CRISPR knockouts now. So with CRISPR, we can go into the genome and we can actually make a deletion in the gene and knock it out and we can make mosaic butterflies that are patchwork for a, a, for wild type and mutant. So in this case, we have this Amazonian Heliconia serrato, and we use CRISPR to knock out patches of, uh, knock out optics and patches on the wing. And bam, that's what we see, right? So it's not surprising that the red goes away. So right, here's a mutant patch right here, and you can see the red turns to black. So red goes away. But not only, it doesn't leave just like a clear cell, but it's actually a switch between black and red. And you can see all the red goes down here. So we know that optics is a, uh, it's a switch. It's a switch between black and red. And wherever you express optics on the wing, again, here's the paintbrush an analogy. It basically paints red on, right? It's like almost like you're painting red over the black. Um, okay. So we have an idea of, of what optics is doing. We know that this is the gene that controls color pattern variation. And there's also a ton of other work from a lot of um, uh, other fantastic labs uh, looking at the population genetics of this gene and phylogenetics and history, right? So it's, we know this is the gene that's causing red color pattern evolution. But when we look at the coding sequence of the gene, it's, it's basically the same between all these butterflies. So it, it's not that the, that the optics protein is mutating, but uh, the expression is different. Regulation of the gene is different between these different uh, regional forms of Heliconius. Right, so um, here's a study led by Ricardo Papa um, from 2016 and Steve Van Bellingham, and they were looking at a, at a, a SNP variation or a, a genome-wide association of, of a, of a, a nucleotide variation with these different color pattern forms. And they're able to, to localize uh, uh, the variation in optics color patterns to relatively small non-coding regions next to optics in the genome, right? So in these association studies, when you see something like this, it, it strongly indicates that you have regulatory variation. So there's variation in regulatory elements that control expression of the gene. And variation in these elements, uh, in this case, uh, underlies natural variation. 
right? So the big challenge next is, is to actually identify these individual regulatory elements that cause variation in red color pattern, um, red color patterns in, in Heliconius, right? But it, it's really hard to find regulatory elements, right? This is all non-coding DNA. I mean, you can't you can't just look for coding versus non-coding regions. Um, you know, traditionally, even in model organisms, it's very difficult to find regulatory elements. But there's there are these newer methods that uh, that look at chromatin structure that allow you to identify regulatory elements um, in in tissue um, that we've been able to adapt to butterflies. And one of the most powerful of these is called ATAC-seq. ATAC-seq basically lets you look where the um, in the genome. Where the where the DNA or the chromatin is, is unwound, and where it's unwound, where it's accessible, uh, that's where transcription factors are binding, and so that's in, indicative of an active regulatory element. Uh, so I, I don't want to go into too much detail because of time. Um, I, you know, I'm happy to talk to you, any of you about this later. But basically, we could do these assays for unwound or accessible DNA. We could sequence uh, the DNA that is accessible, you know, and we can map it back to the genome and make these high-resolution genome-wide maps of regulatory elements of the wing using a tax seek. Uh, this is all work that was spearheaded by James Lewis. He was able to adapt this method to butterflies, and it's very robust and works, works great. We love it. Um, one of the nice things you could do is you could take these different color pattern forms. This is Heliconia serrato, and you can make attack seek maps of the wings. You actually literally cut the wings out and look at the chromatin structure. And you could find regulatory elements that are active in some color patterns and not in other color patterns, right? So, so we see uh, elements like this across the whole genome. But of course, we, we want to look at the ones around optics, right? Because uh, they're candidates for um, the causative regulatory elements that control color patterns. All right, so optics, here's, here's the optics gene. Optics has this huge non-coding region next to it, full of regulatory elements. So all these are all attack seek data, right? Here's different color pattern forms, forewing and hindwing. So you don't really need to focus on the detail, but you can just see all these different peaks here. These are all regulatory elements. So there's a very complex regulatory architecture all around optics here. Okay. Now, if we go back and think about the population genetic data from other labs, uh, they, they've they've localized variation in like the ray, the four wing band, and the so-called dentis or this red triangle, the base of the wing, to these regions here. Right, so what we really want to do is focus on regulatory elements that are in these association regions. Here they are exploded. Let's just focus on these down here. Here they are exploded out. Right, so these are our candidate cis regulatory elements for controlling, in this case, rays, right? So here's the ray mapping interval or a GWAS interval. And we can see here that there's these strings of open chromatin that vary uh, between the ray or the uh, South American and Central American forms here, right? So, the, so these are nice candidates, and we're calling these LR1 and LR2. Now we can use CRISPR to knock these out, right? So we have these candidate elements that we've zoomed in on through association study and attack seek, and uh, we could delete them with CRISPR to test to see if they actually have a function, right? So here's a butterfly with uh, the, the so-called Dennis element or this uh, triangle on the hind wing. Here's a mosaic knockout of one of those regulatory elements. Bam, okay, so again, this is mosaic. So in black here, we have the deletion, and there's wild type. So, regulatory element, one regulatory element. This is the first amazing thing. A single regulatory element, this is like, you know, one 200 base pair piece of non-coding DNA is uh, completely capable of having this major effect, okay, one element. Here's another one. All right, so this is a ray on the anterior edge of the hind wing. Bam, Here, that's an LR2 element. We knock it out and we lose a ray. Again, you know, these are very powerful little elements. It's not like we need 10 of these things working together to make a color pattern, but you have a single one that has an effect like that. Um, 
But we were really surprised as we generated more and more CRISPR knockouts that basically all of the elements affected all of the color patterns. They all had very strong effects and they all affected all of the red color pattern elements, right? So, so uh, there's this idea in regulatory evolution of, of modularity where you should have, you know, a single element that's necessary and sufficient to activate, you know, a single trait. So you can think about, uh, for those of you into Evo Devo examples from uh, like, you know, uh, sticklebacks or, or snake limbs or, or whatever, where, where you have this kind of modularity. But it, we don't see that here in, in butterflies at all. We basically have a network of, uh, of really strong effect regulatory elements that are all working together to make the entire pattern. This is surprising. So basically we have this new model where, you know, all elements are necessary, none are sufficient. So I'm calling this the many necessary, none sufficient model. And very, very recent data from uh, some model systems, mostly Drosophila, is showing that this actually may be a fairly widespread mechanism of gene regulation. Uh, there was a, a paper just out from uh, Justin Crocker's lab in Nature showing where they did a deep dive into uh, the obo shaven baby gene that shows something very similar to this. Like where basically all of all of the elements are are a, a major effect and what we call pleiotropic effect multiple traits. Uh, so th this may be an architecture that we never suspected before, but uh, it's important in Evo Devo. Uh, we didn't really find any evidence of color pattern modularity. Um, right, so it's not like one element, one color pattern, like uh, many of us were expecting several years ago. And also this whole system, this whole regulatory system is quite fragile. So you knock out one element and everything goes away. That's again, that's not what a lot of people would have expected before. A lot of people expect these systems uh, to be robust and to have redundancy, you know, where there's like, where you have to knock out multiple elements to get an effect. Uh, we have a bunch of large effect elements here that do all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's surprising. And uh, of course, we're, we're digging into this more to understand exactly uh, the evolutionary history of this uh, uh, and, and the mechanisms behind this. Okay, let's talk about evolution some more. So that was all in Heliconia serrato. One of the really exciting things we discovered, though, was that a lot of these elements are also completely conserved. Well, not completely conserved, but they're identifiable in Heliconia malpomini, right? So like I said, these things are what, 12 million years diverged. And you know, I, I know this is a, a large complex figure. You don't need to look at all the details, but basically follow the shadows here. Let's think about this element. Here's uh, Melpomene up here. We have the gray shadows mean sequence conservation. So there, the sequence is conserved here. Uh, this is the Dennis, uh, the region of the DNA that we think controls um, the rays. Here it is in Heliconia serrato, we have this big regulatory element. So we have conservation of these regulatory elements across serrato and melpomene. And then also this highly diverged butterfly, dry, dry uh, these are Julia butterflies um, that hopefully most of you have seen flying around where you live. These are uh, uh, primitive or basal heliconians. They have these elements too. So a lot of these elements here, again in gray, they're very, very ancient um, and they're conserved through all these butterflies. And we think these are the ones that are being tweaked by evolution to control color pattern evolution. So, you know, it's not that we have this uh, model, a lot of people were, would have predicted a while back where you have rapid turnover, gain and loss of regulatory elements, but you actually have these old ones that are being changed. And when we knock out these uh, orthologous elements in Heliconius malpomene, we see almost identical effects. Right, we see these pleiotropic effects across all these different color pattern elements. Right, so we have ancient conservation of these old non coding regulatory elements. Uh, and when we make the phylogenies, they look the same between Melpomene and Rados. This is all evidence that likely, um, to some degree, parallel evolution of these ancient regulatory elements has, has driven mimicry in these butterflies. So Pretty interesting, you know. We're actually getting a, a pretty good mechanistic understanding of, of uh, pattern evolution. Okay, so that was all about Heliconia. So let's go back to think about the ground plan and macro evolution of color patterns. What, what's optics doing in other butterflies? Here's a uh, a Grawlis butterfly. So a lot of you may have seen these. Um, again, this is a, a, a basal Heliconiine, right? So it's, it's it's relative of Heliconius, even though it looks quite different. 
Let's see what optics does here. So here's wild type. Here's the knockout. It's a black butterfly. It's amazing, right? You don't have black butterflies in nature, but if you knock out optics, it turns completely black. It's just the most heavy metal butterfly I've ever seen. It's incredible, right? And this happens in other butterflies that we do too, right? So uh, here's a painted lady butterfly, Vanessa Cardui, knock out optics, all the color goes away and it's replaced by black. So, you know, again, these are, these are mosaics, right? So this is a, a butterfly that's mostly mutant on one side and partially mutant on the other side. But you can see this effect where red turns to black, completely blacks out the pattern, right? Again, paintbrush, it's like a paintbrush gene where you express optics you get red appearing on top of the black. This is this is uh, the other side of that mutant. This is an incredible bilateral mutant. Here's the optics mutant side. And it's like a, a photocopy. It's incredible. Just like all the colors completely removed from this butterfly. That's something we weren't really expecting to see. It looks like optics is the single master regulator of color in basically all the butterflies that, that we've, we've looked at it in. Here's a, here's a close-up of that butterfly. And you can just see where you know, all of the, uh, the pigment color, like all the oranges, yellows, reds, they just all go away. Wild type optics knockout, right? Optics is this, the color switch in butterflies. And here's a buckeye butterfly, right? So what we would expect if we knock out optics is the, uh, right, this orange should go away, right? Because that, that's the color pigment, om omicron pigment. And we knocked it out and this butterfly turned blue. It turned blue when we knocked out optics. We were not expecting this at all. It looks like a little tiny morpho butterfly. So this gene is, uh, it's, I find it to be like pretty amazing. It's like, it's very impressive what it does. Not only does it switch between the color and the black or the omochrome and melanin pathways, but it also switches between pigment coloration and structural coloration. So this blue is not made by a pigment, but it's actually made by optical effects of fine scale uh, structural um, elements of, of the scale cells, right? So, so if you change the, uh, basically the, uh, the thickness of, of one of the layers in the scales, you, you can modulate between, um, more like gold, green, and blue iridescence. So optics controls all of these things, controls all of these things. And we're very keen to understand how that works. And a lot of the, the effort in the lab right now is going into understanding exactly how that gene network operates and where it came from. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to talk about that in detail right now. So another, remarkable thing about this blue phenotype is that we see this over and over again in, in butterflies, right? There are many, many unrelated butterflies that have independently of all this black and blue archetype, right? There's skippers, swallowtails, morphos, you know, various different nymphalids, uh, little blues, lysenids, right? Black, the black and blue phenotype has occurred over and over and over again throughout evolutionary history in butterflies. And uh, optics is really interesting because it, it provides a very simple mechanism for why or how this may have happened, right? Because we can actually imagine in all these various different butterflies, these black and blue species that appeared independently, you know, maybe it was just optics. Maybe, you know, I mean, we have a very simple explanation for why we can see the reoccurrence of some forms in nature repeatedly. So, uh, yeah, this is a phylogeny of, of this group of butterflies that includes our lab rat here, right? Many of these butterflies have some orange and brown phenotype. But then here in red, we also have these independent origins of uh, uh, butterflies. Actually, I'm sorry, here, they're color-coded for iridescence here in blue and green. We have, we have multiple independent origins of, of these phenotypes here. And one of the questions we like to try to answer is, does optics underlie um, black and blue switches that occurred multiple times. This artaxia, it's just so cool, right? It looks just like the optics knockout mutant, right? If, if, if you didn't look at the eye spot, it, would, it basically, it looks like an optics knockout. One gene, right, can phenocopy this natural diversity.
the other thing that's really intriguing too is that uh, in Africa, we have this Pressus butterfly. So this is a relatively close relative of our buckeye, Gen uh, Genonia, and it has seasonal variation, right? Part of the year, it looks like this red. Part of the year, it looks like this blue. This is seasonal variation that looks just like an optics knockout, right? So if you knocked out optics in this butterfly, you would expect this to turn black and maybe iridescent blue, just like Genonia. Uh, so again, this is something we're really interested in exploring to see if in this species, optics has come under the control of the seasons. And I'll be talking more about seasonality in just a few minutes. Okay, so these are the conclusions from our optics work uh, where we've been able to really dig into the regulatory basis of a uh, local color pattern adaptation. We found a few surprises that the regulatory architecture of this evolution gene is very fragile, right? Meaning that you know, small mutations in non-coding regions will have major effects across all the color pattern elements. You know, it's pleiotropic, so a lot of these regulatory sequences will affect all the color pattern elements. And also a lot of these regulatory elements are deeply conserved. They're very ancient in Heliconius and also across nymphalids we're finding uh, for other color pattern genes. Um, you know, it's also surprising that optics is a master regulator of all color. So we know that adaptation now in Heliconius is occurring through regulatory changes in a major effect gene, right? So this is not what people maybe would have predicted a few decades ago, where you have a bunch of little changes and a bunch of little um, minor effect genes, like all collectively, you know, making different color patterns. But we know from all the population genetics, you know, the mapping, the knockouts, that we have this major effect gene, and basically we have regulatory tweaking of the major effect gene that uh, is driving adaptation. You know, also based on the images I showed, the last few images I showed you, um, you know, it looks like optics can explain these recurring events in evolution, um, although we need to to test that um, functionally. So that, that's what we're aiming to do now. All right, so let's move on to story number two, the genetics of seasonality. So I, you know, I, I talked about seasonal plasticity very briefly when I showed you that that Pressus butterfly, where you have these two different forms that look like optics knockouts. That one's in Africa, so it's a little bit hard for us to uh, to work on, a little, a little expensive. Um, although we're we're gearing up to do that, uh, it's much easier for us to work on local butterflies. Uh, this is a, the buckeye. Genonia senia, um, that's been a focus of work in our lab basically forever, um, and was also developed as a model system by Fred Nyhout at Duke University um, for looking at things like this, like plasticity and, and eye spot development. And it's a great model system because we can go out and collect it anywhere, bring it into the lab and grow big colonies of it, we can do crosses. Uh, we have regional variation, not as dramatic as Heliconius, but we have variation in eye spots and things like that we're using to map uh, uh, elements of, of eye spot traits. And most importantly, we have this seasonal variation. So on in the Eastern United States, um, in the summer, they look like this, they're tan color. And in autumn, they're a dark red color here. And we think that they become dark red uh, so they can warm up more efficiently. Um, and we, we published a paper on that. Um, on the thermoregulatory benefits of, of the dark coloration. And that, that's pretty common in butterflies in northern latitudes. You see a lot of butterflies that have this kind of seasonal variation where they're darker when it's colder. And presumably, again, that's for uh, warming up. Um, but, you know, buckeyes, this particular species is, occurs all across North America. There are relatives that occur in Central America and South America too. And we're really curious about how about natural variation in this seasonality and we wanted to see if we might be able to use this as a system to understand the evolutionary genetics of seasonality um, like how animals know what time of year it is and, and how they change and adapt to that but these butterflies occur in really different habitats um, these plastic ones i showed you occur in these deciduous forests a lot of the work on buckeyes has occurred in the north carolina strain so that's uh in the southeastern United States. 
you know, where there's, there's you know, fairly strong seasonality. But then we also get these populations like in Southern California, uh, you know, where it's more dry, like more dry desert-like habitats, you know, where, uh, where the seasons aren't as uh, strongly defined as on the East Coast. So, you know, the first question we wanted to ask a while back was, um, is there variation in seasonal plasticity? Or has there been local adaptation in different populations of this butterfly uh, in terms of uh, seasonal changes? So, um, uh, former graduate student Emily Daniels looked at museum collections of buckeye butterflies uh, from all across the, the U.S. So she looked at these western population, mountain populations, and then these, these eastern populations that, that have been more well studied. And when, we, when you look at the eastern populations, you see basically what you'd expect. So on this axis, we have redness. So we have, we have uh, light tan to dark red up here. And you know, across all the specimens she looked at, you know, she looked at the date they were reared, went back and looked at climate records uh, for those localities. And, you know, we could see a strong correlation between the day length and temperature and coloration, right? So it's classic seasonal plasticity. When the days are short and cold, they're dark red. That's exactly what you'd expect. So, you know, it's great to see that in Eastern populations. But uh, we are also very excited to see that when we looked at the Western populations, like from California, that there is basically no correlation between day length and temperature, right? So, um, you know, there's basically no statistical association, a very weak association between temperature and day length and redness. So cool, right? We actually have geographic variation in seasonality and seasonal plasticity in these butterflies. And when you bring them into the lab, uh, that's what you see. So you can raise these California butterflies under different temperatures. Th this is reflectance. So basically like how dark or how red they are uh, right across the, the visual spectrum here. The California butterflies reared under different conditions are, you know, there's a little bit of difference, but it's, it's, it's very, very weak compared to these East coast butterflies from North Carolina, where you have a really strong divergence based on, you know, the rearing conditions, right? So and geographic variation of plasticity. So this lets us begin to ask, how does seasonal plasticity evolve, right? As a, as a mechanistic question. So we are working on the uh, North Carolina versus California system right now, um, doing crosses, and we've made a lot of progress mapping genes that control that, but we're not uh, quite ready to talk about that yet. Um, but we have taken another approach with the, um, just focusing on North Carolina butterflies, where Karen Vanderberg, um, the current PhD student who's been working on this, she did artificial selection to isolate alleles that control res environmental response. So, um, for example, here's an experiment where she started with the North Carolina variety, right? So here where it's warm, they're, they're lighter, right? Again, this is visual reflectance. When they're raised in cold, they're darker, redder here, right? So you have these warm versus cold individuals you know these are siblings um and she did artificial selection where each generation she would select the redder ones or she'd select the the, the tanner ones right so this is what you call alternating selection and this, this was an approach developed by conrad waddington uh in his his fly studies uh, back in the mid 20th century so karen basically repeated that She's able to make a genetic line of these butterflies pretty quickly after six generations uh, that uh, are dramatically plastic. So this is what we call genetic accommodation in plasticity studies. All right, so she has a super plastic line and she's also able to do uh, the opposing experiment where every generation she basically selected for the reddest butterflies to see if we can make a permanently red butterfly. And uh, um, she was able to do that. So after it took a little bit longer, but after 11 or 12 generations, uh, basically selection for redness um, lowered the response curve in these butterflies. So we, here we have a genetic strain where the butterflies have become more, more canalized, right? So they're less responsive to the environment. Okay. This is uh, what many people would call genetic assimilation. Again, that's a concept that goes back to uh, Waddington and, um, you know, even, even Baldwin before him in the early 20th century. Right, so this is a great system now. I mean, we actually have, uh, we have 
genetic accommodation line, a genetic assimilation line, right, where we have really strong genetic differences in plasticity and we can do crosses between these. And so that's exactly what Karen did. She took the line with a really strong environmental response and the line with the much reduced environmental response and she made genetic crosses to try to figure out um, the mechanistic basis of, of these differences, right? This is variation within a natural population, right? These are this is artificial selection. All right, so if you back up a, a minute and think about the mechanisms that could ca cause changes in plasticity or seasonality, right? You could have evolution in cue detection. So, you know, maybe these animals that are changing, like just don't recognize the environmental cues very well. Like they, they can't, their ability to sense day length or temperature is changing, right? So there's some change in sensory organ function. Or maybe, you know, maybe they're, uh, the sensory organs work fine, but they don't send out the hormonal signal telling the rest of the animal to change, right? So we know in most cases of plasticity that we know about in, um, I don't know, like most organisms I can think of, there's some sort of uh, uh, hormonal transduction of the signal going on to tell the rest of the organism to respond to the environment. And in the case of butterflies, it's a steroid hormone, right? So maybe there's a change in the hormonal response or maybe there's a change in how the tissue responds to the hormone, right? So maybe the wing is like picking up the steroid signal in some strains and not picking it up or you know, responding to it differently in other strains, right? So, you know, any of these mechanisms could be changing. So, you know, we wanted to figure out um, how they're changing, what the genetic basis of the change is. All right, so like I just mentioned, the, uh, the difference in color pattern is controlled by titers of a steroid called a like disone. And this is all work done by uh, Debbie Roundtree and Fred Nyhout back in the 1990s. Uh, so basically, there's a sensitive period, you know, uh, one to two days after pupation, where it's, if there's a high steroid level, the butterfly is tan, and if it's low, they turn red, right? So the, the environmental conditions are sensed by the butterfly, the steroid level is changed, and then the color changes. So we wanted to ask if maybe this was responsible for the difference in these selection lines. And it turns out it's not. So again, I, you know, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the details here, um, but basically we have hormone titers at relative developmental time um, for different strains of butterflies. And both the tan and red butterflies uh, have the same hormone levels if you compare the plastic and red lines, right? So the uh, hormone titers are basically responding the same across environmental treatments, even though the color of the butterflies is different, right? So this kind of rules out an upstream change in um, cue detection and signal transduction. So the California butterflies and the, North, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the different strains, uh, the different selection lines, both are able to sense the environment and make the appropriate hormonal changes. So the, so we think that tissue response, the ability of the wings to respond to the Dyson titer is probably changing. All right, so uh, like I said, uh, Karen did crosses. Uh, don't wanna go into details um, here, but basically she did a big F3 cross between the plastic line and the red assimilation line. And we got a big spread of phenotypes. Uh, here, females and males you know, tend to, tend to be uh, um, slight, had slightly different color intensities, so, so we mapped them differently. Um, but basically, you know, we we sequenced 20 genomes from the spread here of the crosses. So 20 genomes of butterflies that responded to the environment, and 20 butterflies that did not respond. So we raised them all at warm temperatures and basically asked which ones are red, i.e., they don't respond, or which ones are tan, i.e., they did respond. And uh, we identified four regions of the genome that um, where there's nucleotide variation that can explain this variation in response. And uh, again, I, I have to skip over a, a lot of data here. Um, and if you have questions about this, feel free to reach out to me, or you can check out the paper. It was just published in Science last week, um, and you know all the information is there. But you know, basically, we, we hunted across these these uh, association regions for genes that were differentially expressed between uh, 
the plastic variety and then the red assimilation variety. And we found a couple uh, great candidate genes for controlling plasticity. Uh, here's one example, Herfst. This is a, a new gene that nobody had ever studied before. And Karen, who's Dutch, named it Herfst, which means autumn in Dutch, so it's a nice poetic name. And basically in the red butterflies, this gene is upregulated. So this is stage, so this is early to late development. And this is the RNA-seq read count, so it's a level of expression. So this gene is highly expressed in red ones and has low expression in, um, in tan butterflies. So let's do a CRISPR knockout to actually see if this controls seasonal color patterns. And bam, it looks like it does, right? So here's a wild type here. Here's a mosaic knockout. So if you zoom in here, you can see these regions where hairs just knock out, knocked out, and the red autumn coloration goes away. And you see the summer coloration. So here's wild type, and here's the knockout. So you can see these little patches of where Herbst has been deleted using CRISPR. And you have a butterfly that's part autumn and part summer. So it's cool. We, we actually make these patchwork butterflies that have different seasons on the wing. Here's another gene, triolase. Uh, we think this gene is involved with, uh, it's an enzyme that's involved with uh, processing precursors, precursors to make red pigment, we believe. Um, and this is highly expressed in red butterflies, um, again, because we think it's making a precursor to make red pigments, and it has low expression in, in tan butterflies. Again, we see the same beautiful effect. So here is a mosaic knockout, here's wild type. So th this is actually the same individual, left and right, okay? So we have these nice mutant patches here, wild type, bam. We get these nice little patches where the autumn coloration turns to summer coloration. And here's another one, Cortex. So some of you may have heard about this one before. Uh, it's, it's pretty famous because this is a gene that underlies industrial melanism in Biston moths. So this is the peppered moth that famously in the 19th century evolved to become black in, in England because of um, uh, basically industrial or air, air pollution where soot was getting all over the trees, right? So there was selection for these things to, to turn black to become cryptic. Cortex controls that. Cortex is also the third major heliconius color pattern gene that controls the yellow stripe on the hind wing. And amazingly, here it is controlling seasonal variation in buckeye. So this gene is really, really super interesting. Um, and you know, there, there's several labs that are doing a lot of work on this gene now to understand uh, what it's doing in all these different case studies. Here, this, this one is expressed really early in development in, in buckeyes in the caterpillar, and it has high expression on the red wings. And again, we knock it out, we get the exact same effect. We get these butterflies that are patchwork seasons. So we have the autumn coloration going away, showing the summer colorations, two seasons in one butterfly. So, um, so we're doing a lot of the same stuff for these genes that we did for optics, uh, where we're trying to identify the regulatory elements that control these differences. <clears throat> so um, here's an example, again, going back to attack seek. Here's all the regulatory elements here around, around cortex in the red line and the plastic line. And here's a big uh, region of SNP variants from our mapping study. So these are nucleotides that are significantly associated with uh, red. And, and we have these candidate cis regulatory elements right here, right in this, this uh, group of SNPs. Here's another experiment. Um, we can talk more about it later if you're interested in this method, but we're basically looking for physical contacts between the promoter of the gene and regulatory elements, right? So where you have double peaks, um, you, you have contact here. So we have promoter enhancer contact right here, this region. Uh, so, so this is a strong candidate and we're knocking these out right now. Um, of course, to to find the seasonality. All right, so what does this tell us about evolution of, of seasonality? So we know that seasonality can evolve really quickly under selection, right? These aren't, we didn't find these genes by mutating them in the lab, right? These are all alleles that were floating around in North Carolina and we isolated them through artificial selection and mapped them. So we, we know that there's variants of Herfst, Triolase, and Cortex 
and probably a couple of other genes that we didn't nail um, in these experiments that uh, give the species the ability to evolve seasonality quickly in nature, right? And they respond, they do respond quickly, right? Uh, we also have a lot of evidence suggesting that this, this effect occurs by sorting of, of regulatory alleles um, of these genes, right? Just a handful of genes. Um, and then, you know, based on the, uh, the steroid titer and, uh, and other experiments, uh, it looks like that the evolution of seasonality occurs not through changes in core mechanisms of cue detection. So it's not that these butterflies are losing the ability to know what time of year it is or to send out uh, the hormonal signals, but evolution is happening in these, these wing pattern genes, these down the most downstream genes that respond to the steroid. Um, and it kind of makes sense, right? Cause you don't want evolution to like to mess with or take away the ability to know what time of year it is, but it's much more efficient to fine tune the individual tissues response to the seasons. And, uh, and there's some really interesting work from Antonio Montero's lab suggesting that uh, this hormonal response is deeply conserved across Lepidoptera, even in species that are not plastic, right? So a lot of things have the ability to, to know what time of year it is, but it's these individual tissues that are deciding whether or not to respond and how to respond. And, you know, this this study I think gives us a couple genes to explore that that mechanism in a little more detail. Okay, so I'm out of time. Thanks for listening. Uh, I, I got to thank all these people. I've been so lucky lucky to have so many amazing people in my lab that that help uh, with this work and you know, people involved with uh, method development like like CRISPR mapping um, uh, and uh, visualizing gene expression, artificial selection, right? Attack seek. Um, uh, all these people um, are just fantastic biologists. And I'm so lucky that, that they've, they've been in my lab. So Lin Lin really got CRISPR going in the lab and did a lot of the, the iSpot stuff. James Lewis is a pro at the, uh, the attack seek and, and chip seek and functional genomics. Um, Arnaud, who has his own lab now at George Washington University, uh, was really key in pretty much, um, all, all the early mapping work, developmental gene expression. Anji Mazo Vargas, who is um, uh, Colombian, actually, she's from Cali. Uh, she did a lot of the work on, on Win A, and she just graduated from my lab, and she's about to start a postdoc with Arno. Rachel Geltman is an undergraduate who did the cis regulatory knockouts for optics and was like the first person to like really get that stuff working super well. Uh, Ricardo uh, was the main driver on a lot of the pop gen stuff and, and actually locating. Um, optics when he's a postdoc in my lab. Karen is a current graduate student who's uh, spearheaded all the plasticity stuff, uh, the, the functional stuff. And Emily was a grad student um, who, who did a lot of the initial work in, in Genonia. So with that, I want to say thanks for listening. Um, I'm happy to take questions now. Uh, if you want to follow our lab, we're on Twitter, Fascinating Pupa, and I post updates on our papers and other cool wing pattern stuff that's happening. And um, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. So I'll keep an eye on the uh, on the chat line. Um, Thank you so much for yeah. that was so nice. So it's such an amazing talk. There's already some questions for you. I can pop them out here if you want. Okay. To. Yeah. So the first one is from Juan Camilo. Could the degree of convergent evolution and coloration in Melpomene arado represent a case of limiting some similarity? in some dimension of the niche of these species. So th th this is an ecological question. Um, um, probably not. I mean, I, uh, yeah, as you go, as you travel throughout Central and South America where these butterflies and other similar butterflies exist, I mean, I mean you, there's a lot of different predators um, that eat these things. And, and we think that these color patterns are mostly working on birds like jacamars. And, you know, I, I think there's so much variation across the whole landscape of Arado melpomene and the jacamars and other predators. Um, 
that it's probably a, a pretty strong general effect. Um, we also know that it's it's not only predators that are driving selection on these patterns, but you know there's also reinforcement um, through mate choice as well. And, and there is variation, I think, within and between species on the strength of, um, of the reinforcement and mate choice. So so that could have an effect too. But my hunch is it's probably mostly the predators, and that's that's a pretty general um, guild of animals. There's a lot of questions for you. Oh, okay. Here's another from Sebastian. How does the fragile system converge several times in Heliconius or even in moths? So that's a super interesting question that we're trying to understand right now. Um, my in, So this is all intuition, but I mean, I think that a quality of the fragile regulatory systems is probably the ability to evolve rapidly. Right, you can imagine. So there's these developmental systems that are considered robust, and most of them that have been well studied are in embryos, right? Which aren't don't have to adapt really rapidly like butterflies out in the field. So I think that if we look at older regulatory systems, we'll tend to see this robustness or redundancy of regulatory elements more commonly. But if you have you know this rapid convergence, this like a really strong natural selection, really rapid adaptation, um, the system has to remain fragile or responsive uh, to mutations if it's gonna evolve. And I think if it loses that evolvability or fragility, um, it won't be able to adapt and it'll die out, right? So, so these are all really interesting new ideas because I mean, people really haven't thought that much about this kind of regulatory fragility before. Um, so it's kind of exciting time to think about this like whole new set of ideas and uh, your question is awesome, right? And uh, um, I mean, hopefully we'll, we'll get some more answers to this stuff in the next decade. There's one here relating sexual selection. Can subspecies with and without optics expression, different color pattern phenotypes recognize and mate with each other? They they can, but they tend not to, right? So if you, so we haven't done the actual experiment where we knock out optics, but our lab and other labs have done these mate choice experiments, you know, where you take forms of erato malpomony from different localities and cross them, right? So we know that they, they can cross because that's how we did all these experiments in the first place, right? Like, you know, taking these different forms and, and uh, making hybrids, right? So they're physically capable but they'll they'll choose usually to mate with individuals that look more like themselves, right? And in evolutionary theory, this is called reinforcement. So it's a preference, but they, they still can mate with each other. That's pretty cool. We have a couple more questions if you have Great. more questions. Really good questions. Okay. This one is part one and part two. Follow under and then Okay, so that's a good question. So how do I imagine the first step for species like Melpomene to start you know, mimicking Arado? How would you have those first molecular steps, right? If a single change is not sufficient to get them to be alike. Okay, so so th this, is, this is basically the big question in I feel like Heliconius Ego Devo right now, right? So we have a situation where you have many elements that are required but none are sufficient to make the pattern element, right? So, so, you, so it's not modular in the sense where you could take one new enhancer, put it in, and that alone will make like one stripe, right? So you need a whole collection of things to make a stripe. But it doesn't rule out the scenario you're proposing where you can have a change in one element, right? So that, that's that's a, a level of detail we don't we don't have right now in this study system where. I mean, presumably, you know, we're getting mutations. I mean, we know from the associations that you, know, you can have mutations in single locations that will that will cause these changes, right? But but we haven't made a connection between like the modular like mutations versus like the modular architecture, if that makes sense, right? So um, I think that you can have a single change 
in an element that will change a pattern element, but that 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 enhancer is not sufficient to make the entire element, if that makes sense, right? So basically we have a system of, of many regulatory elements where you could have individual mutations and tweaks in them that will have small effects, but it's not like one regulatory element per color pattern, right? Does that make sense? Um, and I wish I could answer your question and, you know, that's, that's those are really hard experiments to do, but, uh, you know, on it, I'm gonna try to answer that. <laughs> There's another one. Yeah, genes controlling plasticity, right? So plasticity itself is a trait that selection can act on, right? So that, that's exactly right. And uh, that was actually realized back in the 1890s by a guy named Baldwin. And uh, for many years, people called that the Baldwin effect. You know, the idea that selection will actually tune the plastic response, right? If you think of the curve of, of the response. So yeah, selection can definitely work on plasticity. In this case, what's the adaptive value of plasticity in the system? Um, like I was mentioning, I think it's mostly uh, temperature regulation. So where the butterflies are plastic, you know, primarily on the East Coast of North America, you have much uh, much more severe winters. It gets a lot colder and, you know, the butterflies are actually migrating and, uh, you know, to get out of the cold regions like, like New York where, where we are right now. So I think the the main adaptive value of this, the color pattern plasticity I've been talking about is temperature regulation. And um, a paper we published a couple of years ago where we show that between the tan and red butterflies, uh, there are very significant differences in how fast they warm up and, and how warm they stay. But, you know, in these butterflies and, you know, most organisms that are plastic, you know, it's not just this one trait that we decide to study that's plastic, right? I mean, like, most things are seasonal to some degree. And we focus on the redness as a thing that's easy to look at. But like I mentioned, these butterflies, they also, they migrate. I mean, probably a lot of temperate butterflies migrate in a way similar to my monarchs. So you know, I think this plasticity usually occurs in a syndrome or like a whole package of different phenotypic effects, right? Um, I mean, think about monarch butterflies, right? That's a seasonal, seasonally plastic trait. The, the decision to fly north or south, right? Or like how much fat they, they've stored up or their behavior, are they gonna tend to mate a lot or not part of the year, right? So, um, I mean, your, your question actually hides, like I think, you know, a deeper and really important idea about plasticity in a system, right? Not just a color pattern, but, you know, there's a whole suite of traits that are plastic, you know, many of which we have to look at. I mean, we're just starting to look at, at other traits right now including like I so there's strong variation on eye spot plasticity in these things as well as color and uh wing shape all kinds of stuff right and you know a lot of these I mean you know we don't we don't immediately know what the adaptive value is but you know I like your use of the word system um because that that's how we need to start thinking about plasticity I think well oh, that's really cool uh I think we have two more you okay one? yeah you like that Mauricio, where do I think will be the next major breakthrough on the genetic regulatory basis of wing pattern diversity? It's a good question. Uh, I mean, there's there's a couple things we're really focused on. I mean, the first is just putting together the entire network of genes, right? So we have all of these really interesting genes, some of which, you know, like optics and WinA, we know control adaptation. But personally, like what I'm interested in like in a big way and I've always been interested in is like, where do color patterns come from in the first place, right? Like the the ancestor of, of moths and butterflies, you know, probably looked like a fly and, you know, had a clear wing, you know, with no scales, right? So scales appeared at some point. And then, you know, we, we had the piecewise evolution of, of the, uh, the patterning system, you know, probably like the ancient stripes that appeared and then like other subsystems of stripes we had colors getting patched in, right? So I'm really interested in where the network came from in the first place, how it was assembled, and then how it became more and more complex over time to make all these different colors. So I think, uh, and that's a regulatory question, right? I mean, because we know from like work and basically everything that like all new traits are made from old genes. Basically, 
evolution picks up all these old genes from all over the genome and reassembles them into networks to do amazing new things. And you know, that that's happened in butterfly wings as well, because you know, optics, when a like these are all really old genes that have been roped into new functions. Right. So it, this is a regulatory question. Like how did the regulatory networks come to be in the first place you know, that allow adaptation in systems like like Heliconius. Right? So th that's that's my macro view of the next major breakthrough. And you know, in terms of like having a quantum breakthrough, I mean, I think I think we can put this together pretty rapidly now with new methods, especially like like chip seek and attack seek. So you know, once we find a transcription factor that makes patterns, you know, we can quickly do chip seek and we can see all the genes that it's regulating directly. Right. So a lot of the work in my lab right now is actually involved with putting together like these large networks in, in different species uh, using genes like optics. So um, we just have paper and science advances looking at the optics network um, in Heliconius, you know, showing how we can see selection on the sites. Okay, so so that's kind of macro view, like where do these things come from and, and how do they elaborate? And in terms of like the micro level questions in systems like Heliconius, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the last questions like kind of gets to the core of like the giant question mark right now. It's like, w what's the relationship between this apparent modularity, you know, where you have, you have selection on small non-coding regions with this uh, cis regulatory architecture where you have regulatory elements of like large effect, right? So we know that the, I, mean, I, I suspect that, you know, there's you have selection on independent elements to the color patterns. But then if all of these things are like major effect regulatory elements, like how is that tuning working exactly? Right. So that's going to take a lot of nitty gritty work where we, you know, we do swaps of regulatory elements, you know, between uh, different regional variants and also where we do direct manipulation of like a transcription factor binding sites and like put them back in, right. To ask how, how these uh, elements are being tinkered. Yeah. That's cool. Mauricio just responded you. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. I'm so I'm so I'm happy and, and very honored that you're here. <laughs> and then we have our last question. Um, we would imagine the responses to seasonality might be stronger in caterpillars. Um, could you tell us more about caterpillars, like color and other genes? Uh, I wish I could tell you more about caterpillars. So you know, we don't. It's harder to work on caterpillars because th they're three dimensional. <laughs> Right, I mean, wings are so nice to work on because they're flat. I mean, we can like scan them and do all the experiments on them like so easily. Um, so I don't know. I suspect seasonality is very strong in caterpillars. Um, you know, stronger is kind of a subjective term, but you know, I suspect that there's probably differences in um, maybe like fat storage and definitely behavior, right? Because we know in the temperate zones, most Lepidoptera, you know, as you go really far north, especially right? They sleep most of the year, right? So in a way that's, that seasonal plasticity is a diapause, like the basically deciding when, when to sleep. And in a lot of species that happens in caterpillars, you know, some that happens in eggs, some that happens in pupae, right? So in that respect, yes, yeah, I mean, there's really strong seasonal differences, you know, in the generation that will go all the way through that year versus the generation of caterpillars that will uh, basically sleep under a leaf all winter. Uh, and there's probably differences in, in like fat storage and stuff like that we haven't really looked at. Um, in the species we, we've looked at, there's not strong color pattern seasonality in the caterpillars, although um, some of these wing color pattern genes are, are also involved with color patterns in, in caterpillars as well, especially the pigmentation genes, stuff I didn't really talk about. Um, and you know, there's some uh, some plasticity in various butterflies for um, you know the the caterpillar and and also the pupa being different colors depending on like the color of the leaf or the substrate that it's 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 been living on. Um, the, there's there's one moth in particular, depending on the host plant it's feeding on, it'll look completely different, like a like a like a flower on the plant. You know, some cases, or it'll look more like a twig in other cases, depending on on what it's been eating. Right. So, uh, so there are case studies where, you know, that there's really strong plasticity in caterpillars, uh, but, you know, sadly we don't, 
really know anything about the biology of that. So that, that's a huge open thing to work on. It's truly, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Reed. This was an amazing, amazing talk. And thank you for all your responses, for all the questions. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. And again, I want to say it means so much to me to be invited by students to give this talk. And you know, I hope it was um, interesting and entertaining and hopefully clear. And if any of you have any questions or you know, want to go into more of a deep dive on any of the stuff with me or have questions about methods, um, feel free to, to reach out to me. Or you know, also any, any of the people in that slide in my lab too. I mean, they're, they're all super cool, super smart, helpful people um, that I'm sure would love to interact with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed. Bueno. You're welcome. All right. I hope to talk to some of you at some point. Bueno. Chao, que estén bien. Nos vemos en el próximo seminario. Okay.